So much has changed since last Easter. The world has been shaken. Life has been disrupted. What we once called normal seems like it may never return. It's been easy to be discouraged, to lose hope, to feel the foundations of our faith begin to crumble. It's hard to keep our feet planted when the ground beneath feels like shifting sand. Now more than ever, we need to stand on the truth of Easter, a day which changed our eternity, changed our world forever. Death was defeated by life. Sin was consumed by mercy. The grave was swallowed up by victory. See, even in the darkest of moments, the love of Jesus could not be stopped. His faithfulness could not be broken. And when the dust settled, Jesus, he stood alive and victorious. Today, may we remember the truth of Easter, the power of the resurrection, and the promise of eternity. Yes, the world has been shaken, but the grave, it's still empty. And Jesus, he's still risen. Easter Sunday and welcome to beautiful Kim Beach. He is risen. He is, he is risen. risen indeed. Yes, let's try that again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, I hope that you're already beginning to feel the hope and life that this beautiful day brings. And at the beginning of our service, I'd like to step back for a moment to the crucifixion on Friday and to cast our minds to the cross without which we can't have resurrection day. So let's consider the cross as we sing.
오늘부터 5절까지 읽겠습니다. 안식일 다음 날 이런 새벽에 여자들이 준비해두었던 향류를 가지고 무덤에 가보니 무덤을 막았던 돌은 이미 굴러져 있었다. 그들이 무덤 안에 들어가 보았으나 주 예수님의 시체는 보이지 않았다. 어떻게 된 일인지 몰라 당황하고 있는데 갑자기 빛나는 옷을 입은 두 사람이 나타나 그들 곁에 섰다. 여자들이 무서워서 얼굴을 땅에 대자 그 사람들이 이렇게 말하였다. 왜 살아계시는 분을 죽은 사람 가운데서 찾느냐. 그분은 여기 계시지 않고 살아나셨다. 아멘. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's continue to sing of our risen Christ.
words. It's awesome to celebrate the resurrection together.
awesome. Thank you, girls. Thank you so much, kids. I love that song. It's fun to sing and dance and leap once in a while. Join us in prayer. Oh God, on this joyful Easter day, we open our hearts to you. We open, we open our, our hearts, hearts to the, the risen Lord. Lord. We have seen the power of your love roll away the stone from the grave. We, we have, have seen, seen your, your power. power. We have heard the joy and wonder as your loved ones received the incredible news that Christ had risen. And we have received the unbelievable news that in Christ, death is defeated once and for all. He, he is, is not here. here. He, he has, has risen, risen just, just as, as he said. said. And so we join our voices with all God's people to sing your praises from shore to shore. Hallelujah, he lives. All glory to his name. Hallelujah, he lives. All glory to his name. Amen. this cross and give you the opportunity on Easter, even though we cannot gather together to drop by the church, and as we have done the last few years, to beautify it, to, to come put a flower in it, so we're going to have it outside the church all day on Sunday, and you could drop by and you could add a flower to it. You can but, bring some from your yard, if you have anything in that's coming up yet. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I've seen a few, but... Uh, you could add something specific to it, that'd be great. Yeah. We had some palm tree winners. Now, I know I didn't announce any contest, but I did ask people if they could guess where I was. Mm -hmm. And we did have some people guess. Mm -hmm. Gert, she's on there. Now, she's not one to be on camera very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl and uh, Dan as well. Dan what? Mm -hmm. And he'll often mention, he'll leave a comment on our services at... And that, that is just so encouraging to those of us that are uh, putting the service out there. 
If you want to experiment with that, add a comment after the service, after you're done watching in the little chat area, that would be an encouragement. You could leave it to someone specifically that you enjoyed what they did on the service or generally. Mm -hmm. um, that, that'd be great. Now, for all those who did that, I, I have, we gave these to our youth this last week. They're little crosses. And so I'm going to get these crosses to you this next week as a thank you for participating. And a couple other little things. One, we, uh, we cannot be hold, holding any Bible study meetings right now. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, no, and you'll hear a little bit from Chuck later about the fact that they are continuing to meet on the streets and bless people wherever they are, which is great, and uh, at Street Church, which is wonderful that they're doing that, yep. but we are going to host an online Zoom Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course coming up, and so we wanted to let you know that that is coming up. If you're interested, you can take a look online, research more, and in the next few weeks, we're going to start that and you can be a part of that. This has been a tough time for all of us, hasn't it? It has been. It has, and uh, you know, emotional health is uh, incredibly important, and it's been a, it's taken a hit this this past year for many of us. And this course is designed for us to take a look at our relationship with God and how that affects our emotions and how we can deal with what we're feeling inside and how to place that before God and say, Jesus, guide us in this and yes. ensure that we're being healthy as we struggle, honestly struggle, as we all do. Yes, for sure. Last, I just want to introduce our kids moment coming up, and we got a special kids moment with Carl and Trudy and Doris. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see Trudy and Doris dressed up as Mary and uh, Salome, as they were the two that went to the tomb and found out that it was empty on Easter morning, going with their spices. So you'll see them dressed up and you're gonna be able to see a lot of great pictures from the Holy Land. So enjoy that and then we'll continue on in our service. Bless you. Bless you, God bless you all. It's our Not Just For Kids moment. Good morning and a happy Easter to all of you. Christ is risen. He, he has risen, risen indeed. indeed. Today we celebrate the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross and then his burial in the grave for three days later. I'm Pastor Carl Jensen and as you can see over here is Doris, my wife, and next to her is Trudy McGrath. The three of us are here because we all visited the grave of Jesus in Jerusalem a few years ago. Trudy was there 1967. That's 54 years ago. Do you believe that? <laughs> Doris and I were there just two years ago and we saw the empty tomb. Salome, did you did you bring the spices and the ointment to did I bring anoint them? Jesus' body? Look at all of this. Oh. Mark chapter 16 verses 1 to 8 says, the stone was already rolled away and the tomb was empty because Jesus had risen from the dead. Now in Canada, and in many countries of the world, the dead are buried in the ground. But in some countries, as in biblical times, they're buried in tombs or structures above the ground. Well, I want to tell you that just a year ago, just before COVID hit, Wayne and I took a trip to New Orleans and we took a tour that took us to the graveyard and we were so amazed to see that all of their buried above ground and that they have these structures above ground. And it reminded me that Jesus also was buried in a tomb above the ground. First of all, as you travel around the country of Israel, you'll see caves and stones like this along the roadside. They look like they could be the tomb of Jesus, but they aren't. No one knows for sure the exact place where Jesus was buried. Some feel that he was buried where the large Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands today. This is the place where some think the cross stood and the tomb was carved out of the rock. It is very ornately decorated today. But many others feel that the place is actually about half a kilometer away from here, where today there is what we call the garden tomb. It's a beautiful garden with trees, shrubs, and flowers all carefully and beautifully trimmed and cared for. It is a tranquil, quiet garden where you can sit on a bench to meditate 
of the sufferings and the death of Jesus. This garden is right next to a rocky hill known as Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And sure enough, the rocky surface there looks just like a skull even today. Here's a picture of how the entrance to the tomb of the garden looks today. Here's another view of the tomb. Let's get an even closer look at the entrance to the tomb that was carved out of the rock. The stone that was used to block the entrance to the tomb is located close by today. This is a picture of some of our group going into the tomb itself. Trudy will tell us what she felt when she entered the tomb. As I entered the tomb, I had this holy, holy moment where I almost trembled as I remembered that in this very tomb Jesus laid after he had been crucified and defiled and rejected by people and that as I touched the walls I just imagined what it was like when God raised him from the dead and it just touched my heart so much and I was so thankful that I had that experience. And after that, when we went outside, I sat on this beautiful bench in this garden facing the tomb and kind of prayed and thanked my Savior for suffering on my behalf, for my iniquities, for the things that I do that are not pleasing to God, and that He redeemed me and that the promise I have from Jesus' words and in the Bible that one day when myself and all the rest of us who die will be resurrected and we will be in eternity with our Savior and we will be able to see him face to face. Doris, what did you feel when you went to that tomb? Well, when I was standing in the lineup with the rest of our group, I was, I was very anxious because I didn't know what I was going to see I didn't know what was inside, and I didn't know how I was going to react. But when I got in, I noticed a slab of rock and stone that was level, and uh, that's where Jesus' body had been laying while he was in the tomb. And it was a very sad moment for me because I... <laughs> I had seen the crucifixion and I knew how much he had suffered, suffered for me and suffered for all of us. So um, it, it, it was sad, I, I wept, but um, I knew the, temp the, the tomb was empty, so Jesus had risen. But Jesus is not here, he has risen. That's what's written on the door to the entrance of the tomb. Hallelujah. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Well, I'll tell you, things are going pretty good. We are very busy getting ready for Good Friday. Uh, we're going to be down at Salvation Army at 1, uh, serving up hamburgers. Easter Sunday, we got turkey soup. And Easter Monday, we got bacon, eggs, and pancakes. So it's going to be a, a great weekend, and we're going to have a little bit of a special Easter message on Sunday, try and encourage people to all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and what he has done for us. What a, what a great weekend to celebrate. He is alive and I am forgiven. Amen. All right. Um, we're going to enter into the biblical story of the minor prophets once again. Uh, I used to call them Malachi, uh, but <clears throat> it's from the book of Malachi. A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. 
When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offerings from your hands. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand where he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how, will we re- to our, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else... I will come and strike the land with total destruction. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, isn't it absolutely wonderful to celebrate Easter together? Even if it's in this way, to be able to sing those songs to shout out, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. I encourage you to go ahead and text someone, Christ is risen, see if they'll respond or send a Facebook message or even call somebody up today on Easter and celebrate with them. Thank you so much, Ellie. That was our niece, Ellie, that was helping lead in the worship and the Choi family. It was so great to have you be a part of this day with us. And uh, we continue to celebrate. Now, it's been a big week for some because it's Holy Week. For others, because baseball started up again. Go Blue Jays. Hopefully they do better than our other local team in a different sport. We'll see, won't we? Um, Now, I, I remember hearing the story of a man coming by a minor league team and seeing one boy in the dugout and asked him how he's doing. How's the game going? And the boy said, well, we're losing 18 to nothing. And the man said, well, you must be really discouraged. And the boy said, well, why should I be discouraged? We haven't even gotten up to bat yet. Well, maybe during this day and age, you're able to have some of that optimism. But many are struggling. And that totally makes sense. Sometimes we feel like we've fallen behind, like we're down 18 0 But we don't have to lose hope. And Easter is a day about hope, isn't it? And we've been looking through the Minor Prophets, and we are in Malachi, the final Minor Prophet. And I had wondered, I thought a couple things. One, I thought, boy, this has gone quicker than I thought it would, and we're going to have to go back and revisit a couple of these prophets in a deeper way. But I also wondered what it would be like if we should uh, skip the Minor Prophets during this Holy Week, Palm Sunday 
and Eastern, yet you saw Zachariah, great job on that. Last week, Carl appreciated it so much, how it tied in so clearly to Palm Sunday. And then Malachi, you will see, is a great book for Easter. Now let's pray, and I will show you that. Heavenly Father, we ask once again that you would guide this time as we delve into your word, that you would speak through my words, and that you'd open our hearts to the living word you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yes, this book, Malachi, points directly to the risen one. Uh, yet, like the people of God at the time of Malachi, they had come back from exile and yet had not experienced the fulfillment they wanted. At times we can all sense that longing, waiting. At times, at times it's easier to enter into that than it is the celebration of Easter, especially in the time that we've been going through. At Easter, it's important to remember that when the women went to the tomb, Scripture tells us that they were afraid. At a time when we're going through hard things, it is okay to be honest about the feelings we're struggling with. And many just want things to get back to normal, don't we? But as we've seen, continually seen through the minor prophets, a time of crises can be just the time where we learn more what it means to seek the heart of God. And that's what Malachi had as a message to the people, pointing out their problem, but then also offering promise. And we're going to see that together. For centuries, the prophets had been promising a glorious future, and these people were wondering, where is it? Why do we have to endure through all this? Why are we under the rule of yet another kingdom? Where is that new king, the new David, the anointed one, the one who was to come and set everything right? And even though the temple had been rebuilt, the presence of God had not yet returned. There was no tangible sense of his glory or the symbol of smoke or fire. They were expecting God to show up, but God wasn't showing up like they expected. Now, you put up with me showing bits of Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes each week, and I, I think I've been doing that because I see him maybe as a little bit of a, a, a minor prophet in his own way, revealing truth in our modern day. So here's Calvin complaining, it's freezing in here. Why can't we crank up the thermostat? Well, consuming less fuel is better for the environment and it saves money, says his dad. Now, who has said that? Don't elbow the person beside you too hard. Calvin responds with a, oh, surprisingly. And then dad pops back in. And being cold builds character. I knew it, says Calvin. Now, Calvin's a lot like the people of God here. And a lot like most of us. We love to be comfortable, to have things going our way. And it's why it's such a sacrifice right now. And why some people are bucking against it so much. We, we like to be able to go out to eat be with our friends. I uh, will say, Suda can have food ready for you in a flash. You can pick it up. So good. But not even being able to travel. These are hard times. And we can find it easier to complain, fight against the powers to be, than to say, okay, God, what do you have for us to learn in this? I'm remind, reminded of Helen Merrick's wondering that last year. Are we learning what God is seeking to teach us. Malachi challenges the people of God here to seek the heart of God. And he points out, like I said, that they have a problem. And the problem of the people here dashes their hope. Let's take a look and see how the sin, the problem, affects them. And there's an incredible progression here. So turn once again into Malachi Five, six of the way, it's right before Matthew. And if you are just tuning in and haven't been following this, we welcome you. Welcome to Easter here at First Baptist. And we encourage you to enter into the Word of God right where we've been journeying through. And you can see how relevant it is. 
So, the problem of the people. First off, we see right away that God, well, my, my Bible, my Bible titles it, Israel doubts God's love. Maybe yours does too. It starts off with this incredible, incredible phrase, I have loved you, says the Lord. Well, time and time again throughout these, we've seen the emotion of God, that the God, even of the Old Testament, isn't just this harsh, grandfatherly judge, but a loving, emotional Yahweh, God, the Lord for them. And here in this powerful prophetic book, we see, I have loved you starting it off. Malachi wants us to understand, the Lord wants us to understand. The heart of God is a heart of love for us, but too often we don't receive it. We don't see it because we're looking for something else. In fact, they've become so blind to God's love. God exposes their true feeling. If we look down, and especially pointing to the priests in this verse 6, if we look at verse 6, we see that God says that you show contempt for me, for my name. And again, we see them asking, and Malachi will often use this, but you ask. The Lord states something, and then the people respond, or he says, he pictures them responding, but you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? Now, contempt is something that's fascinating, and people have been studying this. Contempt is something when you, uh, when you don't receive love from someone, contempt is something that can grow in your heart, or when you even when you think you're not receiving love from someone. Dr. John Gottman has shown this in marriages in his decades of studies. If you're not actively fostering a culture of gratitude and appreciation in your relationship, you'll gravitate towards seeing what you aren't getting, what you think you should be getting, or getting in a way that you would like, and that leads you to contempt for the one you think should be giving it to you. You've seen this, haven't you? Maybe you've experienced this or attempted to, to feel it right now. It's what can happen when you're feeling empty, tired, depleted, in crises, struggling with hope. Anyone have any of those feelings right now? Yeah, me too. We might continue to play the part in a relationship, but our heart isn't in it. And that happens is in marriages, and it happens in our relationship with God, and it sure did in Malachi's day. We don't see the love that we expect, even though love is there, it grows into contempt. And then our actions reveal our lack of hope. God points out that though they are back, back from exile in Babylon, though God's enabled them to rebuild their temple and to be in their own land, they are just bringing sick offerings to God. And not sick in the good way that the kids use it nowadays, like, oh, that's sick. No, we're talking diseased, lame animals, so that they can keep the best for themselves. I love in verse 8, the cheekiness of the Lord, if I could say that, who says, try to offer diseased animals to the governor and see if you're accepted. And later, Malachi charges them with, robbing God. The Hebrew word here means to defraud or cheat. In their covenant relationship, they are to bring the best to the Lord, to bring 10% of all that they earn or produce to God. Not only would this supply the needs of the Levites and the priests, the running of the temple and the programs, as well as meeting the needs of anyone who is marginalized, poor, or in need, but it would also free them, free them from that sense of relying on their income, on their, on their money for their security. By not bringing the full tithe and additional offerings, they showed a heart of distrust in God, that they relied on themselves and not on the Lord. Another example that comes up of these actions revealing their lack of hope, their contempt and their sinful attitude towards the Lord is in chapter 2, where Malachi raises 
how the men are divorcing their Jewish wives of their youth in order to marry foreign women. And though Malachi doesn't tell us, my guess is that these foreign women happen to be a lot younger. The men would be creating practical widows for their own pleasure. In 2.16, where a lot of translations would have God saying, I hate divorce, and though that's true, perhaps a better translation would be the NIV, the one that we use today. It says, the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, does violence to the one he should protect. To which Malachi adds, so be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Yes, there's a morality issue here, but there's also a justice issue of how they treat their spouses. Covenant faithfulness is so important to Yahweh. And as an example of that faithfulness in marriage, that covenant and learning what it means to be faithful is strongly emphasized. Instead, the people of God here are showing contempt to the Lord, relying on themselves for security. And then they want to turn around and judge God. In 2.17, we see Malachi saying, you have wearied the Lord with your words. And they say it again, how have we wearied him? And Malachi responds by saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? It's beginning to sound like a conversation with a toddler. It isn't fair. Where is the justice? The people have a problem problem of self-reliance, a sinful attitude, resisting God. And we're all tempted with this, especially during a time of extended trial, waiting, longing. But God has a promise in the midst of this problem. The promise of the Lord brings hope. The first promise here is the promise that God's love doesn't end. If we look at chapter 3, right after this, where they're saying, where is the God of justice? We see that God says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Yes, the Lord's love is a tough love. They will be disciplined for their complacency, idolatry, and injustice. You think you can stand? You want justice? He'll be like a refiner's fire, a launderer's soap, washing you clean. Oh. I did say, I did say that this is about God's love, didn't I? I promise that his love doesn't end. Follow with me down to verse 7. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me. You hear here an echo of Joel that we talked about. And I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. God's love calls them back to return even after all they've done, even after how they've treated the Lord with contempt. God's love does not end. The question, of course, is could they trust that God could provide a way like this messenger is going to do? The promise, of course, here is that we can all be washed clean because of God's love for us. Amen? Well, more on that in a second. And the second promise here is I want to show you is a promise of blessing. Now, we talked about how an example of their contempt and their actions was how they were robbing God. Do you know that living in God's love does bring blessing? Here in Malachi is the only place in Scripture that God says to test me. 
verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. The church today wonders, wow, where is God's blessing? And yet the church is held back on the tithe. And giving is not about us feeling guilty or trying to give enough to appease God. That's what the people were doing back then. Our giving to God, no matter how you do it, whether you give to the church or mission partners, supporting Christian organizations, it, it's a representation of how we feel about God, how we are trusting God, if we are putting our faith in ourselves or in the true provider. What God is saying to the people of the time, and I believe to us today, is if we are willing to put our trust in God and to show that practically with our generous giving, we will be taken care of and abundantly and beyond. I'm not talking a prosperity gospel, but our needs will be cared for, both physically and spiritually. So don't hold back. There is a promise of blessing. Now there's one final and fairly important promise that I want us to look at, the promise of the risen one. I told you this was an Easter book. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Surely the day is coming. All will burn like a furnace. Verse 2, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. Now we could go back through the rest of our minor prophets, through Isaiah, through the Psalms, and we could show you how Jesus is often pictured like this as a son, the son. But why make a sermon even longer this Easter, eh? Do I hear an amen? I thought I did. Of course, Malachi didn't know who this son of righteousness would be or what the healing in its rays would look like. But we know. And, and boy, I tell you, I admit, some translations would say healing in its wings. And I liked it the translation, healing in its rays. The Hebrew can mean both, by the way. For we understand that, don't we, when the warm sun comes out after a long winter and we feel its healing. And Jesus comes to bring healing to both body and soul, healing for the problem of the people of God, healing for the problem of our world, the problem of sin. And then Malachi says, you will go out and frolic like well-fed lamb, calves, <laughs> calves. Your translation may say, skipping about like calves, running from their stalls at last. And I love that. Have you seen this before? Calves pent up because there's no food in the fields during winter, but when spring comes, the sun brings out the grass. And look at them go. Uh, if you're tempted at all to frolic as the grass comes out, two things. One, I want it videoed, and I suggest you do it with a buddy who can pick you up when you fall and can also video you frolicking. Because we're all feeling a little pent up these days, aren't we? We wish we could just run and have freedom. But Malachi's point here is that even in the midst of a lockdown, we who revere the Lord, who trust in the Son of Righteousness, the Risen One, can experience true freedom. True freedom from sin, from problems that plague us, and freedom from the lack of being able to see the love of the Lord. Christ is risen. Now you may have trouble saying he is risen indeed. Maybe you've been struggling with that today where you're doubting the reality of Jesus' work in this world. If you are, that's, that's okay. That's a temptation that we can all have at times. You may be even feeling angry with God for what's been going on in the world. It makes sense. These are strange, tough times. 
When the women came back from the tomb, when they overcame their fears and came and told the disciples about what they had seen, Luke tells us that they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. So if you're tempted to lose hope like them, let me remind you that what Malachi sought to encourage the people with, a future hope, 400 years yet to come, is one that we can look back to as historical fact with hundreds of eyewitnesses. The reality that we celebrate today, the promised son, has indeed risen, and there is healing. There is healing for the problems that we are going through. Jesus has come to be the answer, to wash away our sin that separates us and keeps our eyes blinded from seeing the love of God, our complacency, and the injustice. You want to know that God has loved you? Well, Jesus shows us that. He went to the cross. And that's why we can beautify it on Easter Sunday. So he went to the cross to die to pay our price and rose again for you and for me to ensure that you know the love of the Father. We don't need to lose hope. Hope means hoping when things are hopeless, G.K. Chesterton said, or it is no virtue at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, hope is mere flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. We can bask in the rays of the love of the sun of righteousness, frolicking like well-fed calves in that living hope. Well, speaking of being well-fed, we are going to celebrate communion, and there's no better meal than this one that we're going to participate in today, a meal of living hope. And so I invite you to get your elements, and if you haven't got any yet, to go and grab those. I'm just bringing mine up right here. For Jesus, on the evening before he went to the cross, he gathered his disciples, his followers, and he let them know what was going to happen. And he told us to do this again and again, to remind us that he gave his body when he took that bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. He gave us his body to pay the price of our problem. That messenger came. You know who that was, John the Baptist. And he said, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. That sin that keeps us from him. And he poured out his blood and he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the cup of the new covenant, a brand new restored relationship to God. As the Lamb of God, he came to deal with our sin. So let us bless the bread that gives itself to us with its terrible weight, its infinite grace. And let us bless the cup poured out for us with a love that makes us new. Let us gather around these gifts, simply given and deeply blessed. And then let us go bearing the bread, carrying the cup, laying the table within a hungering world. So take a few moments as the music plays to serve each other or to serve yourself, the bread and the cup. And then we will sing together about this living hope that we have.
the gifts of God for the people of God, especially this Easter.
Well, Jesus is our living hope, isn't he? Thanks so much for joining us in our Easter service this weekend. And you can drop by the church right here and you can add your own flower to the cross. It will be over by the wooden doors. You can park and come and add your flower to it as we recognize the cross is a thing of beauty. And as you go from this Easter service, I invite you to open your hands again and receive this closing blessing and benediction. May you know that the Son of Righteousness has risen with healing in his wings, in his rays, his light and love spread to you. That Jesus has dealt with the problem of our sin and has risen to empower us to live in a life that is flourishing and full. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Exactly, I know, I was thinking. <laughs> Happy Easter, he is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs>